get it started. Ayan Hirsi Ali is a Somali-born American activist, writer, and politician. She is known for her views of criti views critical of female genital mutilation and Islam, and supportive of women's rights and atheism. She co collaborated on a short movie with Theo Van Gogh uh, entitled Submission. Critical of Islam, it provoked controversy, death threats were made against the two, and Theo Van Gogh was, of course, assassinated. She has an active fatwa out against her. She fights anyways. She is in constant danger. She fights anyways. She was told to shut up constantly, all the time. She does not shut up anyways. This is what it means to be a firebrand. And this is why this year's uh, headline speaker, this year's keynote speaker, fits American atheists and me personally very, very well. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to bring to the stage our keynote speaker for the American Atheist Convention, Ms. Ayan Hirsi Ali. Thank you, American atheists. Can you imagine how comfortable I am with you? <laughs> I want to start with some acknowledgments. First and foremost, our president, Daniel Silverman. David Silverman. <laughs> I've got something with names. <laughs> and then I would like us to acknowledge Christopher Hitchens. I was thinking, how would he like us to acknowledge him? Would he want a moment of silence? Would he want a standing ovation? Yes. yes, stand up and acknowledge Christopher Hitchens. I miss Christopher, and right now, I would ask him, so Christopher, if we wanted to resurrect you, would it be the moment of silence or would it be the standing ovation? <laughs> Happy Easter. <laughs> and then I want to acknowledge my friend Sam Harris. <laughs> You don't have to stand up. If you feel like doing it, you can. Uh, but when I, yay, Sam Harris. <laughs> I don't think I've met anyone more spiritual than Sam Harris. He persuaded me to meditate, among other things. <laughs> but I want, to, I want to share with you what, you know, how persuasive he is. He persuaded Majid Nawaz to write, to have a dialogue with him, a decent dialogue. And it's a very serious dialogue. And the two of them are coming up with a book very soon, and I want you to know about it, read it, tweet it, and acknowledge the fact that Sam Harris got this gentleman from saying, Islam is a religion of peace to maybe we have problems. <laughs> Don't you think he should be in the State Department? <laughs> I also want to acknowledge Daniel Dennett. 
today. Come on. What a gorgeous beard. Doesn't he remind you of Santa Claus? And then, of course, Richard Dawkins. I mean, come on. You gotta stand up for Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Stand up for Richard. Stand up for Richard. He is in his 70s, and he has a fighting spirit I haven't seen in anyone else. Richard Dawkins is convinced that he single-handedly will convert humanity to reason, and I'm with him there. And then, of course, finally, the sad news, just so you know who we are up against, Charlie Hebdo, Stéphane Charbonnier, and all the others who were killed this year. My new year was spoiled and will remain spoiled terribly because of that, and you know it. And Stéphane Charbonnier is the man who said, I would rather die standing than live on my knees. I hope you are with him. I would rather. I would rather die standing than live on my knees. And that then brings me back again to David Silverman. <laughs> David, where are you? Yay! <laughs> I got a few brief moments to talk to David today, and I asked him, why Memphis? <laughs> I mean, if he said, well, it's the place where Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968, I would have said, oh, yeah, yeah. It's all about the civil rights movement. But he didn't say that. I also expected him to say what my waitress said last night. And forgive me for butchering the accent, but it sounded something like this. You came to Memphis <laughs> to eat, to drink, and to listen to the blues. And so I thought, hey, atheists, they want to eat and drink and listen to blues. So they're in Memphis for that. But David Silverman said, no, we're not here to eat, drink, and listen to blues. I mean, that's a bonus. But we go to places where we know that there is a great deal of religious oppression. Last time, it was in Salt Lake City. Now it's Memphis. And I think that's a great strategy. It's a great strategy. Can you imagine in 2015, in the United States of America, being an atheist and having to come out of the closet? Can you imagine that? And yet, my message to you to today I want to leave you with three points. And let's think of it as if we are brainstorming, because as atheists, that's what we do. We spend the day thinking instead of worshiping. So my first thought is that we want to acknowledge that there is a difference in 2015 between religions. Christianity in America may be at its worst, so oppressive as to have individuals within a Christian family say, I want to follow my conscience and have to deal with family, members, neighbors, communities, and say, well, if you do that, then I don't love you anymore. If you are a woman and you tell your husband, I don't want to go to church anymore, I don't believe it, you run the risk of being divorced with all the consequences that we know. If you are a man and you do the same, you also run the same risk. 
if you happen to be a member of the LGBT community, you're even talking about laws being passed not to serve you a cake. There's a gentleman, and I want you to look him up. His name is Shelby Steele. Who groaned there? <laughs> well, as an atheist, you're supposed to at least take note of his argument, his experience. But he inspired me in many ways through his books. And one of the statements he makes there is, during the civil rights movement, if you were black, or right before, if you were black, and you would show up at any place, they wouldn't serve you. They wouldn't take your money because you were black. You weren't supposed to be there. And he says one of the biggest achievements of the civil rights movement is that after the racists and the bigots were defeated, what stood between a black man and whatever he wanted to consume? It was his wallet. And I think that the LGBT community today is at a place where you can afford to say to he who doesn't want to serve you or she who doesn't want to serve you, well, okay, I'm going to take my money somewhere else. And it took a long time to get there. And we're not yet there. In Christian America, when women fight for their reproductive rights, the right to work, the right to own their own bodies. And it's a long history of maybe about 200 years. But as a woman living in America, I can celebrate. I can say to the sexist, go F yourself. <laughs> I understand I empathize, and you have my support in fighting religious bigotry. And in Christian America, there's probably a lot to do. But I want to draw your attention to a different kind of religion. If you become a Christian apostate, the highest price you will pay is that your family, your neighbors, your community will disown you. And trust me, I understand that pain. Nothing has hurt me more than my father and mother tell me, well, we cannot accept you unless you continue to what? Deny my conscience? So I understand it. If you are an ex-Christian, the kind of pain that you have to go through. and what a big battle it is that we have to fight. Yet, given the limited resources we have, the limited time we have, and the potential energy and force and magnitude and resources of the Islamic threat, I want to draw your attention to the religion that threatens us the most in 2015. As an ex-Muslim, I have come to terms with the fact that my family will not accept my conscience, if only they would leave it at that. But I haven't come to terms with, and will never come to terms with, the fact that all kinds of strangers out there who happen to have been raised in the same religion that I was, want to kill me. And not only me, every single individual who was raised within Islam, who was raised within Islam, and who doubts the truth of Muhammad, the truth of the Quran, today runs the risk of being killed At lunch, I ran to an ex, two ex-Muslims. One, he said, my name is Mohammed, and I'm an ex-Muslim. 
And I said, whoa, what are you going to do about the name Muhammad? <laughs> and he said, well, I'm Muhammad the atheist. And that's heartening. It, it's so delightful. But less delightful is when I ran into the next ex-Muslim who is from Bangladesh, Saeed. And he said, I'm from Bangladesh. And I don't know how much of the news you follow, but you know that within two months in Dhaka, Bangladesh, Muslim fanatics took meat cleavers to kill individuals. We don't even know if they're ex-Muslims. We know that they're secular. We know that they were thinking. We know that they were writing their thoughts by blogging about it. And because these zealots found them online, they followed them and took meat cleavers to them and killed them. As an ex-Muslim, as an apostate of Islam, that's what you are up against. And it's not only in Dhaka, Bangladesh, it is right here. You think I want to be around these gentlemen all the time, 24 hours a day? Hey guys, I love you. <laughs> and I'm grateful to you. But we go on and on in America about privacy. And I have to live in that bubble and think what privacy do I have? That is what it is to be an ex-Muslim and speak out. But what if you're an ex-Muslim and you want to get out, come out of the closet? Close it? Well, come out of the, maybe it's something more, more narrow, much smaller than a closet. It's a small box. Your conscience is narrowed down, and all day long you spend lying and lying and lying to your parents, pretending that you're praying five times a day when you don't want to pray five times a day. Given our large families, if you come from a Muslim family, somebody is going to notice you're not reading the Quran, you're not fasting, you're associating with infidels. And the term infidel in Islam is very broad. It covers absolutely everyone who doesn't worship in that narrow way. And so that's my first point. I wanted to highlight the difference between the religions. If you are gay, today in the United States of America, the worst that the Christian community can do to gay people is not serve them a cake when they want to get married. I tweeted Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, whom I think is very brave, by going out there and describing what it is that the LGBT community faces in predominantly homophobic communities. The discrimination is subtle, and it lurks in the shadows. But I just want you to think about being Muslim and gay today. In the worst case scenario, you've seen it on television, on YouTube, whichever channel that you use. That to be accused, you don't even have to be gay. If you're accused of being gay, you are marched to the tallest building in town and bullies throw you off that building. And there is a crowd of people waiting there who stone you with glee. And as they do that, they scream, Allahu Akbar. And they cite that that is how the punishment is for gays in the Quran and in the Hadith. This is 2015. In the best case scenario, if one finds out that you 
are gay, and in Islam, stories about lesbians are not told that much, but we're talking about gay men. You're a gay guy, and you think, okay, I don't like girls. What will your family do? They'll force you into marriage with a girl. I know over the years I have spoken out about forced marriage of girls and women, but there's also the forced marriage of the gay community. And can you imagine what kind of a family you establish when you do that sort of thing? If you are a woman living in the United States of America and you face people who in the name of Christianity will challenge your reproductive rights, you will get to a point where you're going to have a debate about whether the state is willing to dispense contraceptives or not. The big fight is not with the American government. The big fight is with your own family, your siblings, your own community, your own neighborhood, the church you used to belong to. That is where you seek and demand acceptance and you find that you're not accepted and so that's where the battle is. But in the world of Islam, whether it's a Muslim community in Dearborn, Michigan, or whether it is in Saudi Arabia, quite the other extreme, what you're facing is a stultified, frozen moral system from the seventh century that demands that you be covered from head to toe before you leave the house, that you need a male guardian, that you're forever, forever a slave. If you are raped, it's your fault. The burden of proof lies with you. If your father dies and leaves anything behind, then half of it will not go to you. Only half of half will go to you. It's such a blatant discrimination in the name of religion. It is segregation, the worst kind of segregation we've ever seen. Because in many of those radical Muslim homes, there is a space for women and there is a space for men. And it's a very unhealthy arrangement, I can tell you. And that takes me back to the gays, because a lot of Muslim men will have sex with little boys, they will have sex with men, but they will erupt in joy when they see a gay man put to death. It's that kind of hypocrisy, it's that kind of sickness we're up against. And by the way, it's not only atheists. I want you to take note of the plight of religious minorities in Muslim countries and within Muslim communities. So what, if you want to be a Christian and you're in a Muslim community, a Muslim family, I'll say, you know what, please read Richard Dawkins. That's about the worst I can do to you. I can introduce you to some Harris, but I will never ever threaten to disown you, to kill you, to be rude to you or anything. Today, if you are a Christian or Jewish or even any of the myriad minorities within Islam, you cannot practice your religion freely. And as atheists, our job is not only to defend our own narrow path to reason, I think that our Effort should also be about defending the freedom of conscience in general. Voltaire, I do not agree with what you say. I despise it, but I will fight to the death for the right, for your right to say it. If you want to be superstitious, go for it. I don't like it, but I'll put my life on the line to defend for your right to say that. That is the soul of a free society and an open society. I think it is very rich for societies to have various forms of superstitions. For one, it's entertaining. <laughs> Today I learned about, um, down here there was a lady who was, I asked her to do my hair and she was amazing. And she sort of figured out what I was going to do and who I was. And then she said, think about the Jehovah's Witnesses. I forget the exact number, but I thought she said that 
the central idea of Jehovah's Witnesses is about that 144,000. Is that the right number? Yes. She's <laughs> only 144,000 people will go to heaven. And then she was asking herself loudly, this woman from the south in Memphis, she's saying, then why do you guys go about every summer trying to recruit people and convert them? <laughs> We, we don't want, as atheists, we don't want to be unreasonable. We don't want to be dogmatic. We want to be the answer to dogma. We don't want to be intolerant. We want to be tolerant. I don't say to my mother, well, if you don't become an atheist, then I'm not your daughter anymore. I say to her, I love you anyway. That's who we are. We are the ones who are reasonable. We don't want to get carried away in mob lynchings. But we do want to use our brains and our faculties to see that religions are different. They are not the same. I also want us to know that we can prioritize. I'm disappointed with some of my feminist friends because they seem to only want to go after the white sexist man. And so he gets improved all the time. <laughs> and he gets repaired all the time. But what about the rest of us? <laughs> this time I got a good cheer. <laughs> what about the rest of us? Also, if you really think through racism, wouldn't that be the racism of low expectations? Wouldn't it be that? You keep fixing the white man until you can't fix him anymore. But what about the brown man, the black man? Is it politically correct to say the yellow man? <laughs> so again, to go back to the religion of the day that threatens us. And we have seen manifestations of what the threats look like and can look like. And I think one of the most important, less, there are a few people who go around talking about it, in, in, but it hasn't been acknowledged massively, is that Islamic extremism threatens the very core of human civilization. If you are no longer allowed to feel compassion for a human being, in heretic, my latest book, I discuss, and it, it's just one of the most agonizing points. It's, the context is Mogadishu, Somalia, or Baidowa, Somalia. It's a place in Somalia. And there's this woman who is, she complains about being raped. And she's taken to a Sharia tribunal. And she's sentenced to stoning. Imagine, she's the one who's raped. That's what I mean by civilization. There's no longer a sense of justice that you don't even think anymore. And these men, talk, I mean, I just want you to picture a young woman and you have all these men discussing it, judging it, and coming to a conclusion that she needs to be stoned. And then the stoning is implemented. She's put, they dig a hole in the ground and they put her in and they surround her. And sadly, there are women too who are doing that. And they start the stoning. But there is a man who's moved by all of this cruelty, and he runs to rescue her, and they shoot him. And there's an eight-year-old boy who runs in because he can't take it, and he wants to rescue her, and he's killed. Human compassion, the impulse that had that man and that child demonstrate their compassion for such an obscene form of cruelty is punished down. And there is a book called the Quran. And in chapter 24 of verse 2, it says, flog the adulterer and the adulteress. And you will all say, but that's what it says in all of the holy books. But I want you to read the next sentence. And it says, let no compassion move you. There's nothing more terrifying than that if you're not allowed for compassion to move you, then that is the end of civilization. 
You know about the Holocaust. I wanted to remind you of the Holocaust. I lived in the Netherlands for 14 years, and I took note of the Holocaust, but the most compelling stories were the stories of the Dutch and other Europeans who were moved by compassion and who risked their own lives to save their Jews. If you demand, let no compassion move you, as the current Islamic State is doing in Iraq and Syria, then your goal is, your objective is, to demolish civilization. And we've seen the demolition in practice. We've seen them go beyond human beings to statues, cultural heritage. Just the picture of a man taking an ax and destroying statues. What is that about? That is about an attempt to demolish civilization as we know it to rewrite history in the name of barbarism. That's if they can write. <laughs> Yet, having said all of this, and this is my third point, acknowledging that religions are not the same, acknowledging that there's something specially challenging about Islam in 2015, acknowledging that maybe that's where we need to focus on. I also want to emphasize that not all Muslims are the same. And you can do a PhD on trying to create all the different categories and shades of the 1.6 billion Muslims. But then I have got only 14 minutes left, so We'd be here forever, so we wouldn't do that. I want to talk to you about so three categories of Muslims. And if you ever take the time to read about Islamic history, as many of you have done, you will notice a difference between the figure whose name is Muhammad and whose picture we cannot draw. When he starts preaching in Mecca, He's pretty much doing locally what people used to do, you know, come to my religion, I want you to give up your gods, come to my God, and um, I'm the last prophet, and, and of course he's mocked. But within those first 10 years, he does not resort to violence and he does not preach violence. But he's insistent, he repeats that message over and over again, long enough to win a bunch of people over. So today, there is what I would call the Mecca Muslims, people who observe the religion of Islam along those lines. They pray five times a day, they fast in the month of Ramadan, they aspire to go to Mecca or they go to Mecca, they have all of these rituals, and so in a way it does fit into the description of what we have come to call a religion, but they don't hurt others. I think I could be wrong, but I think that the Mecca Muslims are the largest number of Muslims today on the planet. For one, because as a, you, know, you can't really afford, if you are a Muslim, to worship, literally, without you know, things getting out of hand. And then the very opposite of that are the Medina Muslims. The Medina Muslims they emphasize Muhammad's life during his period in Medina. Very triumphant, you know, he had a small militia. He provoked a war with the Mecca community. And to his surprise, he won. And then he declared that's because Allah was on his side. And it's in Medina that he invents this, you know, this whole idea about martyrdom, you know, fight to the death because you will be rewarded afterwards. He invents it in Mecca, but it takes hold in Medina. But then the use of brute force, 
the complete disregard for human conscience and for human compassion, unfortunately, sets him on a path where he starts to win war after war. And today we have Muslims who hark back to that time, who think pure violence is going to get us back to those days of glory where we not only defeated this small group of tribes in Mecca, but we established empires. That is the history of Islam as told by Muslims who believe. But in 2015, in the modern age, it's very hard if you are a Medina Muslim to maintain. It's very hard to maintain that you are superior to everyone else. It's very hard to maintain that all human glory rests on you. I just want to ask you, the Medina Muslims, those guys who flew into the Twin Towers, what is it that they've invented for the last 200 years, or for the last 10 years, or for the last 1,000 years? They want to make bombs? You've read Insp Inspire? The Al-Qaeda manual, go and make a bomb in your mother's kitchen. Absolutely everything in that kitchen was invented here in the West. They haven't invented, they haven't had anything to do with it. They can't even make those bombs. Most of the time these things explode or explodes in their fingers, in their hands. Taking an airplane and flying it into a tall building is not innovation. It's not glorious, it's destruction. And it's that kind of destructiveness that tells you exactly what this is about. The Medina Muslims are dangerous because nothing holds them back. Not the inner conscience, not the outer conscience. Look at the Islamic State and tell me about their creativity. They're destroying human creativity and humans. But what is their creativity? What are they getting creative at? Torture? Put a man in a cage and set him on fire? And then videotape that and put it on YouTube? This is not a smear by a biased press. It's their own propaganda. They want to win and recruit through fear. And they hark back to Muhammad's time in Medina. But there's a small group, and that's what I'm hopeful about. There's a small group, an expanding group of Muslims, driven by their own sense of compassion, driven by their own sense of conscience, who are standing up to them, who are refusing to teach their children those verses, the sword verses, who are refusing to accept Muhammad's period in Medina, Atheists, American atheists, as you know, more than anyone else, this is an evolution. It's not going to happen overnight. It's those individuals who are asking questions who are going to bring about the change. It's the gentleman ex-Muslim I ran into who says it took a long time. In my own story, it took a long time. These things take a long time. But I'm asking you, asking you, begging you, let's fight this threat with the pen, with images, in, within the law, in the most non-violent way we can which is once you start to trigger thought, again, the Bangladeshi young man, he said, once you start thinking, you can't stop thinking, which is true. The question mark starts popping up, and they just don't go away. And as an atheist community, A, we need to embrace those reformers, those ones who are asking the questions, and B, we need to stimulate them to keep asking those questions. How do you think that Christianity was reformed? 
because those absolute truths were scrutinized, held up against the light of the day, the big questions. And to this day, asking questions, critical thinking, is what has enriched Christianity more than anything else. You sitting here are ex-Christians or maybe ex-Jews. I'm an ex-Muslim. I'm telling you, 1.6 billion Muslims, not all of them, but many of them, most of them, will benefit from you asking those questions. As an atheist community, I do not want us to be caricatured as those people who have absolutely nothing to do but to attack Christmas trees on the 25th of December. <laughs> or to gang up on a small business running a pizzeria. That's not who we are. If we want to face up to the big questions of the day, the big question of the day is how are we going to apply that evolution of critical thinking and enlightenment and share it with our fellow human beings, 1.6 billion of them. That's one-fifth of humanity. And again, the good news is there is a group who's doing that. And in that process, in that evolution, that's going to take a long time, I asked myself, if I wanted to, you know, leave Muslims to their superstitions, but at the same time maybe bring about some kind of change that would accomplish the very basic, which is the separation of politics from religion, what would it be? And I've come up with these five amendments. The attitude of Muslims, number one, the attitude of Muslims toward the Quran and Muhammad, that needs to be challenged. It's going to come from within. There are reformers who are asking those questions, but they will benefit. They will benefit from your questions. And in the age of the internet, you can tweet those questions. You can publish them, you can blog them, you can reach out in so many different ways. Perhaps even more important, is that message that is drummed into the head of, of every Muslim, that life after death, life after death is more worthwhile than life before death. You'll find people who are angry with me, who say to me, how can you say that Islam is a cult of death? Then I just want to stop talking about after death then. Stop talking about the day of judgment. Stop teaching children that this life is worthless and that they're going to be judged after they die. If you insist on life after death, then you are a death cult. <laughs> and of course, I don't have to explain to you Sharia law, Islamic law. That is all about control, control, control of the mind, control of the body, control of society, control of the family, control of women, control. It's so controlling, it's so totalitarian that you start to wonder, goodness me. And we, we didn't even get to amputations and beheadings and you know, what the Islamic State is doing. But if you want to know when Sharia law is applied exactly as Muhammad intended it, then look at the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. They keep warning about hell. And then they invite young people to come to where? <laughs> I mean, if I ever imagined hell, it's the Islamic State today. <laughs> There's a less known precept in Islam which will be known to all ex-Christians here. It's called commanding right and forbidding wrong. And it's the obligation for every Muslim adult, men and women, to condemn what they think is wrong, 
fast in their heart if they feel that the person who's doing wrong is stronger than them. And then by using their voice, for instance, don't sit like that. And then with the use of force. And if you then mobilize individuals to act on that, you're going to have one side of society correcting the other side of society. And in practice, I have seen it. It is a menace. It is vigilantism. It's somebody willing to use force just because they are stronger than you are. And that needs to be questioned. Commanding right and forbidding wrong. Look for it and ask every single Muslim what they think about it and if they will join you in fighting it. And then obviously, I have 53 seconds left. <laughs> and I can tell you this in 48 seconds, 47, 46. <laughs> Jihad, I mean, holy war. How can you not ask questions about holy war? How can we not demand holy peace? <laughs> My last sentence to you is, let's go, stop going after Christians and Christianity. Let's go after Islam as a, the most threatening doctrine of our time. Let's ask them those questions that we put to the other religions. Now, I will have, I will take your questions. Brilliant. Five? Okay, I'm going over time. <laughs> if we want time for questions. Okay, um, we will be brief. We will take a few. A question is an interrogative statement that ends in a question mark. We will not sermonize, we will not lecture. I will cut you off. Thank you. Now, <laughs> The first question that, that I want to present to you, thank you for being here. Um, Islam right now, you know, we woke up today and learned about the attack on the school in Kenya. Yeah. We hear of these violent attacks every day. And when we consider the fact that within Islam, there are a number of people who actually are speaking out. There is a moderate wave who are pushing back on the terror wave, um, but they don't really seem to be making much purchase. I would love to hear what you think can help those to bring, uh, to bring Islam back into line with modern society, but I, I wonder if you also think that this is simply a perception issue. Maybe we here in the West are not aware of the, the things that are being done to stop the news of you know, this violence, stop the violence from happening? Um, there are reformers. If you take heretic, my, and again, that's what inspired me. It's the reformers. It's the people who are demanding change who inspired me to write this book because it is in them. I just want to, uh, I don't know, how many of you uh, followed the Arab Spring? Great. So those massive demonstrations. And I, and I want to highlight two of them, one in Egypt and one in Tunisia. And in Tunisia and in Egypt, what you see is a struggle between Muslims who are secular and who want to live under a secular government and Muslims who want Sharia law. And in Egypt, we saw this whole trajectory toward elections and the Muslim Brotherhood coming to power. And within one year, Egyptians standing up to them and pretty much giving the following verdict. We would rather live under a secular dictatorship than under a theocracy. Now, given that evidence, it would be, you know, narrow-minded and dogmatic of me to insist that there is no one there who wants reform. 
a lot of people, all those thousands of people we saw, and again, in Tunisia, the same thing. Tunisian struggle is very interesting. Follow it. Where you have a secular-based government or movement or party persuade the population and win their trust so that they can form the government, it also tells you that they are reformers. When I talk about reformers, I'm not talking about Muslims becoming instantly atheists. I'm not talking about Muslims liking me or acknowledging me. No. I'm just talking about that basic step, which is, would I rather live under a secular government or a theocracy? We've seen in 2009, the people of Iran march. And who are they marching up against? The a theocracy. So if you take that, that gives you reason for hope. But then how can we catalyze that? And the way to catalyze that is to ask those questions that we asked of Christians five, 600 years ago that the questions that are posed to Israel, to Jews, the questions that Indians, I have been to India and I have seen, it's just amazing, Indians asking the very same questions that were asked of the Catholic Church five, 600 years ago. And it is through asking these questions relentlessly, writing about it and sharing the ideas and all of that rich history that we can expand the number of grassroots people who are going to demand change. And I don't think we're going to see change in the Muslim world come from the clerics. It's just won't. We're not going to see change come from the despotic states. They might have an interest, as does the current government of Egypt, in a revolution in religion. But as you can see, there's very little he can do. It's going to come from those individuals who are here, the ex-Muslims, and these ex-Muslims of North America, ex-Muslims of Europe, I've met with them, I'm an ex-Muslim. It's going to come from those people. We just need to be confident that we can ally ourselves with them instead of the government of Saudi Arabia and Iran. Thank you. Okay. Okay, all right. Um, I see a question here in the front. Yeah, okay. All right. Meet them in the middle. Meet them in the middle. I think you just alluded to the answer to this question, but I ask it anyway. Do you agree with the proposition that the moderate Muslims legitimize the extremists? Who are moderate Muslims? I mean, what is moderate? We're not talking about temperature here. I think that the term moderate Muslim is as useless as it gets. A moderate Muslim. What do you mean by a moderate Muslim? Somebody who's not going to blow himself up along with you? If that's the definition of a modern Muslim, that's then one thing. I don't think it's a useful term. That is why I went into the Medina Muslims and the Mecca Muslims and the ones who want to reform, the, the guys and girls who are risking their lives to bring about change. If you want to look about at the Mecca Muslims, those people who follow in Muhammad's footsteps or who want to follow in Muhammad's footsteps during his period in Mecca, maybe those are the people we want to call moderate. But the problem with them is that they haven't made up their minds. They're trapped in that cognitive dissonance. They could move either way. They could go with the reformers or they could join Medina. And I think that there's a large lump of people there who initially just want to go about their business. But if you start to provoke the dissonance, which is what the Medina Muslims are doing, and one way to provoke the dissonance is to ask Mecca Muslims, it's not enough to pray and fast and go about your business. If you're a true Muslim, you'll also join us in jihad and commanding right and forbidding wrong and Sharia law, etc., etc. And then what happens? If you're young and if you're impressionable, and I was young and impressionable at the age of 15 when I was confronted with those questions, I ended up on the Medina side. I joined the Muslim Brotherhood. I thought Salman Rushdie had to die. I covered myself from head to toe, and if there was an Islamic State back then, I would be one of those teenagers who's sneaking out to get there. And one of the things I learned from my own life story is, but what if in that room where there's this woman who's posing these questions, there were other people from the other side 
asking the same questions. Is there life after death? Was Muhammad moral? Is Sharia law the best system of government? But there was no one there asking those questions. No one. And to my great sadness, that woman came into my class and was making her attempts at indoctrinating me and my classmates in Nairobi, Kenya, in a relatively poor school. But there are large Muslim communities in the US and in Europe. And they go to school in the US and Europe, the citadels of enlightenment. And nobody asks them those questions. So forget about this whole separation of moderates this. It's not as if, also moderation implies this. It implies as if, oh, this whole mecca category, they sat down and they thought about it and they reduced their religious convictions and practices to a well thought through philosophy. It is not like that. It's not like that. First, the basis is formed, which is you do everything the Quran says you ought to do. You follow Muhammad without asking him any questions. We're investing in life after death before. All of that is formed before you even get to it. It's, it you have these ideas well established in your head before you're 15. What the Medina Muslims do is once they pose that challenge, they then say, but you must be a hypocrite because if you believe in these things, why are you not then coming on our side? And so that is why I think we need to move away from labels like moderate because they cloud, they cloud the situation. I think that within the Mecca group, we can, we meaning those of us who want to bring about change, whether it's within the reformers in Islam, the atheists, or anyone who wants for this string of terror and subjugation to end, that we need to provoke a dissonance within the Mecca Muslims, but do it in such a way that they are forced to think before the Medina Muslims brainwash them. We are taking this final question, uh, which will end in a, set, in a question mark. Thank you. Well, kind of following up on that last question, you've been attacked as well as Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins for being an Islamophobe from the left, yeah. from leftists and feminists. My question is, is it a contradiction for us to criticize Islam as an irrational religion, just like Christianity, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, to seem to acknowledge, as you do in your new book, that there are Muslims that can reform it? Is that a contradiction to, for us to criticize Islam or Christianity? It applies to both as irrational, but then yet be willing to say, well, not all, is, not all Muslims want to blow up people, and not all Christians blow up abortion clinics. So are we contradicting ourselves? So, so sustained, sustained constructive criticism, sustained constructive criticism is going to lead to change. How do we know that? Because it has done so with all other isms. And it's always better to have, and this is from the public speaking to the public. It's not just even a conversation between governments or power speaking to the people. It's just you as ordinary citizens speaking to ordinary citizens who happen to be Muslim. And so that kind of constructive criticism and debate and discussion, that I think is going to bring about change. In order for that to happen, we also need to feel safe. And I think what the Judeo-Christian West has accomplished is not, it is not the elimination of bigotry, it's not pure and 100% enlightenment, it is a system within which individual human beings can discuss with one another and disagree with one another. If you live in Indiana and you're gay, you may not get that cake from that bakery, but they're not going to throw you off a tall building and kill you. Way back, that's how it used to be. And the big achievement, the reason why, oh, she's so crazy about the West. Of course I'm crazy about the West, because we can have this discussion. I'm not demanding you agree with me. When you get to the point of, okay, um, how, it's not, you know, what about the left? 
And again, here is where we, who, are, who claim to have converted to reason and enlightenment and individual thinking, here's where we need to see that it is absolutely possible and manifest that people can be secular and yet in their beliefs display the same religious orthodoxy as the monotheistic, well-organized religions. There are some people on the left who are just incapable, absolutely incapable of thinking because their orthodoxy is, I believe, I don't know, you're a pacifist, you're a pacifist, so force may never be used at all times. Uh, they have something, I don't know, I'm not talking, I, I hate to say they, because it's, it's, it's some of these convictions are, you know, uh, capitalism is evil, communism is the best way to go. That's a secular orthodoxy. And you can have, you can criticize capitalism and you can criticize communism, but what's religious about it or what is, what's narrow and fixed about it is the fact that you don't welcome criticism. So the human brain can be dogmatic and the dogma does not necessarily always have to come from religion. And I think our job is to keep it dynamic with those big question marks constantly. Thank you so much.